Welcome to another episode of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. And a buddy of mine today, he is from a baseball hotbed of a school, Philadelphia Textile. Is it? Is it even still a school, Bobby? Yeah, easy, easy. First of all, Delaware would never play us, um, so I don't want to hear it. Um, yeah, no, it, it was Philadelphia College of Textiles and Science, a big engineering school when I went there, and it's known as Thomas Jefferson University today. I was trying, I was reading up on that, and this is this is my good buddy Bobby File. He uh, lives lives in the tri-state area, and uh, it was one of those things, Bobby. When you see it, you just you think, wait, Phil, where, where this? Yeah. It's got to be a typo type of thing. Right. I was trying to read up and I saw that it had changed names and, and everything else. So that's what I was trying to figure out. So we're trying to help put them on the map a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you'd be surprised. There's some, I mean, if you look at the history of the school in terms of baseball, it's division two, small school, but there's been three or four, four guys that played in the big leagues from, from Philadelphia college of textiles and science. Were you the latest or is there one that, since you were there? I was the latest uh, buddy of my close friend, my trauma bull, left-handed pitcher and another guy, uh, they were both drafted the year after me. Um, Sean played like 13 years, p- played up the AAA, but injuries just didn't make it. So I'm the last, yeah, I'm the last one out of Philadelphia. Philadelphia College of Textiles and Science. I mean, it, <laughs> it's still one of those things. It's just, it's just hard to even say. And so you go, so going to school, so, I mean, you think that this is, were you going to school to play baseball or were you going to actually get a degree? Because you know how athletes can no. be. We go to, to, to do one side or the other. There's not, you can't do both from what most athletes say. Yeah, obviously. Um, I was a late bloomer. Um, I started school early at an early age, like the cutoff date. I started like kindergarten at four. Um, so when I got to college, I was a late, like I said, a late bloomer. So I didn't get a lot of offers out of high school, even though I did well. I went to a Catholic uh, Catholic high school in Northeast Philly and, and did well, but I didn't do well to my senior year, like really well. And it was kind of late for the Division One schools, you know, especially locally. Skip Wilson at Temple made a last ditch effort to kind of recruit me, but I was already lined up to go to Philadelphia College of Textiles and Science because of engineering, quite frankly. I had I was going in to get a computer science degree, which, you know, looking back on it where I am today, it's the best thing I ever did um, because, thank God, because baseball only lasted so long. But but ultimately, I was a late bloomer. It's the best decision I made. I mean, we can get into it. I mean, I never pitched an inning, an inning in high school. I was a shortstop in high school. I, I was and, reading up on that yeah. and seeing that. So that's, yeah. that's your thought process, one. So usually guys like you at a D1 school are – trying to help keep the curve right you're the guy that sets the standard yeah. right, above everybody yeah. else so now you're at a school with a bunch of guys that are all like you and you're not a pitcher you're you're an infielder correct yeah yep yep i played uh i came in as a as a middle infielder and then i was moved to third base uh in my freshman year what made you who, who came up with the idea of of wanting to throw you on the mound i mean it's one of those things where they you know you yeah, see that in yeah. the minors where all right everything is exhausted for what you can do so all right well let's just throw them on the mound or was it something that you were wanting to do and uh once you signed it was it was a combination of things uh in high school i played outside of high school you know you played american legion ball you played different and i pitched i dabbled in pitching a little bit but my high school coach would not allow for two-way players he was like so old school so i wanted to play shortstop and hit so i never pitched but then when i got to college my junior year you know division two we're strapped from pitchers as is we have no no i mean all of our pitchers are two-way players center fielders third baseman um so we had a couple guys go down so in inner squad i i said you know i can I can throw some innings just to kind of fill, you know, fill the time in inner squad. And uh, I was throwing and my, my college coach, Don Flynn, who was, I mean, played minor leagues for a lot of years, coached at Temple for 20 some years. I mean, he knows pitching. He was a pitcher. Uh, so he was like, okay, I might bring you in to pitch some games this year as a junior um, to close games out, like late games and things like that. Cause we were, you know, we didn't have much pitching, no bullpen whatsoever. Our starters went full and full complete games every game. Um, and that's kind of how I dabbed into it. And, uh, my night, my senior year, I wound up starting on the weekends because we had we had no pitching really. We had a couple guys, and I started a few games my senior year and just threw you know, 150, 160 pitchings per pitches per outing, just blew it out. No idea what I was doing, just throwing as hard as I could, throwing snapping off sliders as hard as I could, and um, you know I had scouts coming to watch me play third base, and I, and that's how the scouts saw me pitching. I mean, you're a big. What's how tall are you, Bobby? I'm six four. Okay, so you're a six four. You're a big dude playing third base, right? So then yeah. you know that's wanting to, you know the maneuverability and then learning trying to pitch and everything else. It's not something you can just pick up overnight, right? Unless, especially learning no. to throw off speed. I mean, yeah, you can get up there and throw hard. I mean, nowadays you yeah. see position players pitching anyway, right? Yeah, I mean, I short arm the ball a little bit, so I had a lot of movement. 
and guys who faced me um, knew I just had a, a, a late sink. And I didn't know necessarily at the time I had that, but I would get away with them something, especially with the minus five bats back then. I mean, you would, I mean, you some of the blast, you know, you hit with the minus fives. Um, so it was, it was kind of like a, it, there was a learning curve there. I didn't really start to learn how to pitch until I got into pro ball because I knew I had to kind of use my nerdness, my brains to kind of learn how to pitch because uh, I, I had no idea, literally no idea what I was doing. I would just pitch aggressive. So my sinkers in would get, go really in. Like, and I started to really pitch effectively, knocking guys down. And that's how I, because I know as a hitter, and I talk about this today, I hate it when guys would buzz me or knock me out off the dish. And then I was like, okay, I hate it getting hit. It doesn't matter how hard you're throwing. I mean, you know, you, you get you get buzzed a couple of times. You're like, this guy's a little nutty on the mound. And that, that was kind of my mentality. And I kind of kept that through the minor leagues, um, just just being willing to, you know, throw the guy's neck at any time. That was, that's my motto. So were you pretty good at swinging the bat as well? Or was that just something that, you know, the, the pitching just go, ah, I couldn't do it as an injury. Yeah. Well, I was all right. Um, yeah. My senior year, I, I led the nation in hitting in division two, um, hit five forty two. Um, so I was a pretty good hitter. I uh, so to say, um, but yeah, so I, I loved hitting um, and I understood hitting very well. It's just that uh, when, when, you know, different teams were, were at games scouting me, Toronto was one of those teams, and it was Ben McClure, a scout who's been around Toronto for 30, 30-plus 30 years at the time. Thank God, because I would have never got drafted if it wasn't a veteran scout who wanted me to get drafted, because otherwise they'd be like, who's this kid out of Division Two? never pitched really, and we're just going to take a flyer on him? Um, it just it doesn't work that way, especially knowing what I know about Division One baseball now, having coached Division One for a couple of years. There's so many guys in front of you at playing Division Two. It doesn't matter, just the numbers, the, the amount of extreme – just great athletes you have at Division One level. It's just uh, the chance of getting drafted. Looking back on it now, is uh, I still, it's kind of the odds are de were definitely against me. How did they find you? Is the biggest thing, I guess. Is it were they looking at somebody else, or were they there specifically looking at you? You know, you hear stories of, you know, they were yeah. scouting one guy and then they saw another. That's, I mean, that's usually how it is. That's what usually puts you on the map. Yeah, especially in the in the northeast part of the country too. Like you know, I mean. It's it's it was hard getting pulled from the northeast part of the country when you have you know those warm weather states like Texas and California. But for me, they were looking me looking for me as an infielder, like as a hitter. Like I was drafted technically on paper as a third baseman. Um, it wasn't until I signed and I got to you know uh, short whatever it was uh, extended spring to kind of before short season that they made me a pitcher. But um, and then two guys, like I said, two guys the next year were both drafted, one in the fifth round, one in the 16th round. And that was because they would come to me every come see me every game. We had these two other pitchers that threw pretty hard and they were actually pitchers. And those two got drafted. Like you said, they see me and the scouts are there. They see somebody else. And so we had three guys drafted in two years out of Philadelphia Textile. So they draft you as an infielder and they tell you, hey, you oh, yeah. go to the mound. You're going to pit and go, wait, what uh, I mean? What is that? That's coming through your agent. Or is that just them saying, no, nope, we're going to do this and that's what it's going to be? You know, it's funny. They um, Ben McClure sitting at my dining room table with my dad and my mom back in my Northeast Philly home. We're sitting there and he's like, listen, he's like, we're going to give you like a couple grand. He's like, but you might have to pitch. I'm just going to put that out there. We're going to send you to Medicine Hat, Alberta, but you might have to pitch. Are you OK with that? And my dad's like, yeah, he's fine with it. He's great with it. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, sure. You know, you're 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 I was, what, 21 at the time. I was like, yeah, sure. Whatever it takes to play pro ball. I'm like, yeah. But then, you know, it's another story when I got to Medicine Hat, Alberta. And they're like telling me to do poles and run poles and run miles with pitchers. And I'm like dying. Like, this is crazy. I'm like being a pitcher and I'm sitting in a bullpen. I mean, it was, it was depressing at first. It really was for me. Medicine. Hey, you're up there in hockey town, minor league oh stuff. My God. Way up it there. was what a town. I mean, talk about culture shock for me. I mean, you come from Philly with, you know, it's a big city, big populace. And you go to medicine. It's like 30,000 people. And we're living with a host family after living at college on my own. It was just strange, and it is a big hockey town, huge minor league hockey team. Um, it was a great town. Looking back on it, I wish it wasn't my first season I played there because I didn't, because I really would enjoy the people in the town more. I was just so, just culture shocked, like being that far away. I mean, it's right above Montana. It's in the middle of nowhere. That whole league, the Pioneer League, was, I mean, middle of nowhere. Talk about some really, really cool towns you got to go to. Looking like if I went there today, but at, when you're 21, you're like, what am I doing out here? Uh, trailer parks around every corner it was like the boonies who uh who else was on that team with you that progressed through and made it to the bigs oh, we had i mean i was i was lucky in the minor league in the minor leagues i became a closer and the reason i was lucky because we were so good in the minor leagues our teams i was just talking about this the other day our medicine had team alone like rookie ball you're talking the lowest of all levels 
we had me, uh, Jay Gibbons was there. He won the Triple Crown. Uh, we had um, Orlando Hudson was there. Uh, Scott Cassidy. These all played in the big leagues. Uh, I think we had four big leaguers off that team, including myself, which is unheard of for a rookie ball team. What year uh, was that in the medicine hat? That was 98. Okay. 1998. And we set like a record for Pioneer League. Our, our first half, we I think we lost like 10 games the whole first. It was crazy how good we were. And I was getting closing opportunities with such a winning team. So I was kind of lucky. I had a lot of opportunities. To move from, so you went from medicine hat to where the next year? Well, that, that's where it got tricky because I knew going into spring training the next year, I was going to be, I was 22 years old. And I said, for me, this is where my nerdness came out. I started analyzing where I was in the organization and what I needed to do. if I was ever going to come close to the big leagues. And I really looked on paper and, you know, there was, there was rookie ball, short season. There was short season, a high, a, then there was low, long season, low, a, a long season. Then there was high, a long season and then double a triple a. So for me, my goal going into the spring training was to make the Dunedin team, the high 18s. There were people around my age, but I didn't realize how challenging that would be to jump over two levels to get there. Um, so that off season, I, I, I was, I was just talking about this the other day. I literally dug in. I still have books on my bookshelf over there, like Nolan Ryan, Nolan Ryan's pitching Bible, the ABCs of pitching. I started reading because the internet you didn't have as much video as you had today in the internet. And you could, and I was just studying everything I needed to do to get better as a sinker bowler slash slider kind of reliever. And that's, you know, I went into spring training knowing that my goal, my goal actually was to make the double A team. It was a stretch goal. I know it was ridiculous, but I, I made that known to some of the coaches. You know, you, you kind of, you get to know coaches really well and you have to play that game a little bit too. You, I mean, you're just a, you're just a name on a piece of paper. And unless you open some eyes as a, I mean, I was a 19th round, but unless I open some eyes, I'm not getting nowhere near double A. Um, and that's kind of my goal. And, and after spring, I made made the A ball team, made the high A ball team in Dunedin. So that's a that's and that I was thinking about this the other day. That was somebody asked me that question. The best league I think to play in was probably the Florida yes. State League, by far. The best, especially where you by guys far. are. You guys are in Dunedin, so I mean, you know, half your games, probably ninety percent right of your right games are in Tampa. Yeah, in Tampa, we're in Port Charlotte, yeah. so I mean, and then your longest trips three hours over to Vero, yeah. uh, West Palm, or anything else. And you're twenty two years old, right? You're hanging out. Yeah. In, you're in right. Ybor City in Tampa. Uh, with yeah. with that kind of stuff, and that was the thing too. You're right. You go through that. I signed '99. I was in P Pulaski, Virginia, which is out yeah. in the foot of the hills, the Appalachians. And then the next one is Savannah. Sorry. No, the Savannah was, and they had, oh, but you had you those went, bus yeah. rides from you had Columbus, Georgia to I think they had a team in Springfield, sure. New Jersey. So you had these long bus rides. And you're yeah. right. You look at that stuff. Do I want to? Oh how can I avoid that? I mean, I'm sure those bus rides in Medicine Hat were oh the worst. It was the, the longest ever in my league history was from we went from Medicine Hat, Alberta to um, Ogden, Utah. It was 20 hours one way. <laughs> it was insane. We, we had two off days the whole of summer and they were both spent in the bus driving from uh, to Ogden and back to Ogden. It was crazy. They, I, we were sleeping on the floor. I, I remember it was hell because we all we had such a big roster being a rookie ball. Everybody shared seats on the bus. And it was it's not like it is today where you have iPads, iPhones, you can watch videos. I mean, I have my Walkman like my CD Walkman listening to CDs and it was, it was terrible. I mean, some of those bus rides, and people don't realize like some of those minor league bus rides, especially being a reliever, you're on a bus eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, one way. And then you're playing a game and you're sleeping for two hours. And then I have to come in and close the game one run game. I mean, the Southern league in double a was just as bad, if not worse. Um, and that's why the Florida state league, getting back to the Florida state league. I mean, it was great. It was humid. It was hot. It was great for pitchers. Um, and it was just, it was not much travel. So you were arrested every game. And, uh, that's where I was able to really kind of set my, get my, get, at least make some, open some eyes and, yeah. and, and kind of set this, set the tone for me moving through the organization. And that Florida state league, you remember those days, it would always rain every day at four o'clock. So batting practice day, always rained rain. out. Yep. So I think that, that, you know, elongated, I think our, our bodies through that. Cause you know, we'd go where we were in Port Charlotte and there's not, there wasn't much to do, right. You had to go. So we'd go out, you know, go play, go out to the bar, hang out, go to bed at two o'clock, sleep till 10, 11, lay at the pool. And yep. all right, there's the rain batting practice canceled yep. and you're playing in big league ballpark. So the clubhouses are massive, are massive. Awesome. So you could get three, four lockers and, uh, and do all kinds of fun stuff. But you're right. That's the kind of where you start to see if, if you're capable of doing it, of, of making that yeah. jump, moving to the next level, right? Because you're in a big league ballpark one, and there's a lot of guys there that can that can throw and um, and can actually pitch, you know. It, so it's 
and learning to do that. And, you know, you're, you're fortunate enough. I've had a couple coaches that were there as well that played yeah. in the big leagues to help. And, that, you know, e advancing, right? You have those coaches helping out, moving on through it. Uh, Edgar Caceres was my hitting coach that year. Mm -hmm. Great guy. You know, you're just learning different stuff. But you're right. Those are some big ballparks we played in. They were great. It was, it was, it was really good. And I'll tell you what, again, talk about the organization at the right time. You have to be a little lucky to get to the big leagues too. And I know, you know, that, um, especially in my scenario where I was just, you know, I want to be pitcher 19th rounder, but our team in a ball and that Dunedin team was stacked. I mean, talk about stacked. I mean, I think we had seven or eight big leaders on that team. Um, which is again, unheard of for a ball. I mean, we had my middle infield, the Cesar Torres and Michael Young. I mean, talk about ground being a ground ball pitcher. It was, it was a dream. I mean, they would, they would make plays that are like on highlight reels, like every night. It was unbelievable. That's right. When Mikey um, got and traded. Had, and, and then we had Vernon in center, Vernon Wells in center. I mean, up the middle. And then we had Josh Phelps behind the plate. They all played, played in the big leagues. And then Jay Gibbons at first. I mean, our team was so good. So as a pitcher, especially a reliever, if you have guys behind you, you can make all the plays. I mean, even, even the plays that, you know, typically go through holes, like between Michael and Cesar, I mean, Mike Young, I mean, I know you had him, I know you played with him in Texas. I mean, talk about the, the ultimate professional. I mean, probably like my top three of guys I've ever played with in terms of, you know, playing baseball the right way. Yeah. He got traded. That, that was the year. I think he got traded for, he, he was my roommate on the road that I remember I was, it was his roommate on the road and, and he, and he was like, Oh my God, I got traded. He's like, my agent's saying it's a great thing. He's like, but I remember he was like freaking out. I remember it was for Esteban Loaiza and I think it was Australia or something like that. And, um, and uh, Mike was, it turned out to be obviously the best thing that ever happened to Mike because I mean, he was, he was doing well in the Toronto organization, but again, you get traded for, for a frontline starter at the time you're going to get, you know, all the opportunities in the world and the team that team took you. And that's what Texas did. Yeah. And you're right. We think, you know, the, the higher you're drafted the more opportunity you're going to get. You know, so you've had, right, to yeah. fight for, you've had to fight for, you've seen those guys. I mean, I know the, the, the draft has since dwindled down, but I think Piazza was like a 59th round pick, yeah. right? Because and it was the, like, out of favor, out of Philly, out of West Philly, yeah. right? Yep. So, and, yeah. And, and, and it's like, uh, one thing too, Orlando Hudson was like a 58th rounder yeah. Yeah. out of junior college. Yep. And that's yeah. what I mean. And it's just, that's what, that's what you, you don't see, you, it, you know, it's not like football, these you know, big time schools. Yeah. These are schools that are not, not so much obscure, Unless you're a baseball guy, but you know, like we talk about Philadelphia textile, Orlando's from yeah. Darlington, South Carolina, junior college out there. You know, it's stuff where, you know, it's you wouldn't find stuff, and it's it's amazing yeah. though to see. You talk about you talk about that work that you put in and the amount of and what you go through. Like you said, the guys that you played with to help you, you know, push through that mm -hmm. that level. Because I played that year. You said '99 was that was my draft year. So the next year I played with Mikey and those guys in the fall league and learning and being around those guys. Orlando, a yeah. uh, Joe Lawrence. Guys, you know, I'm trying to think of some Joe other Warren. guys. Yeah, some of those guys, you, you know, you see and you kind of build that camaraderie with, even though you weren't oh, on yeah. the same team, uh, you guys were still going through that, those battles yeah. together, right? You know, I can't yeah, imagine now what those bus rides are, even if they still have teams in Medicine Hat and uh, oh, I know. wherever. You know, you go through, you, I remember they used to have those leagues with the hats and you would see, well, where's that? I've never even heard of it. I know, I know, right? I know. Yeah, it's so funny. It's, it's it's crazy. It's a crazy experience. The at least it was. The minor leagues have tightened up a little bit, got rid of a lot of teams, but I mean, it was a different experience. And I, I part of the reason going to textile actually helped me because I would play at some fields, especially early on, like in Medicine Hat, and you know, count, not counting the Florida State League, but even Double A, where I thought these places were palaces. I mean, for me, playing Division Two, I mean. We didn't play. And other guys struggled. They really struggled the first couple of years. They're playing at UCLA. They're playing at, you know, Texas A&M at these big monster stadiums. And they come to, you know, low minor leagues and they're like, they're struggling. They can't even cold showers. There's not even warm water. I mean, it's, it's an adjustment and, and living that lifestyle is, uh, that's why you, I mean, you see, you've seen how many guys, how many guys did not make it. And they're way, way more talented than I ever was. I mean, I see guys to win the wild at a ball. It's unbelievable. It was unbelievable. And that's the, you know, you, you're right. You talk about, um, you know how things were but it kind of it forced you to, to like you said to persevere through it right you you mm -hmm. say so you turned on your brain right like, hey, how am I gonna do this what do I need to do thinking through it as opposed to just you know uh, let me just yeah. let me just decide you, you were figuring out what what you need to do and how how you were going to get better doing it and, and you had guys around you pushing you through to be able to do it right especially where you're from. I'm from Philadelphia textile I'm from Delaware yeah. nobody's gonna you know I have to put this work yeah. in to do it right I'm not it's no silver spoon no, blue collar mentality. I mean, that got me to the big leagues, period. Uh, my work ethic, I mean, you can ask anybody to play with me. I mean, bar none, I tried to be the hardest worker on every team I was on ever. 
Um, and that, that took me to the big leagues and my, ultimately probably ended my career, but trying to play hurt all the time. But, uh, but that, you know, run through walls mentality, people be surprised. Everybody gets the guys that get drafted. They're great athletes. They're unbelievable talents and they get into the minor leagues and, you know, things aren't coming as easy as they used to for some guys, some guys, you know, there's some pretty impressive athletes I've played with over the years, but some guys, you look at them and you're like, how, with all that talent, how, how do you not, you know, take this a little more seriously? And I saw a couple of guys in the lower minor leagues that happened. Once you get double A kind of weeded all those guys out, double and triple A. And then obviously the big leagues, it's, I always say there should be a four A and a five light before the big leagues, because the gap between triple A and the big leagues is so huge. Um, that did the level of talent, in my opinion. I mean, it's it's night and day. Yeah, and you see, I mean, we've gone to these Frisco Rough Rider games. People ask us, so this is where people make, make that jump from. It's from double A to the big leagues. You know, mm -hmm. this is where your rookie, this is where your guys are. You know, your triple A yeah. is your kind of like your taxi squad guys that are, you know, it, it's mm -hmm. it's it, it's tough. But you're right. You get to double A, you get from A ball to double A. And those guys, just, I mean, oh. velocity can, just increases you know, exponentially how, how these guys are, right? Because they learn how yeah. to pitch. They learn how to pitch as, a, as opposed to just being throwers. Yeah, it's interesting because I was I was talking to this a couple months ago when we were talking about, you know, hitting through the minor leagues. And I think Mike used to say this, Mike Young, and I know definitely Bobby Higginson who grew up in the in the area used to say it. Like once he hit double A, this the hit the only thing about the pitchers, they were they threw harder, they had better stuff, but they're all around the zone. So con guys that made contact a lot and like really knew the zone, like Mike and, and like Bobby Higgins, he said it was easier for him to hit. They become better, better hitters. And I saw that with Mike following his career. He became better and better. And he got in the big leagues. He was playing the best he ever was in the big leagues. He was never like that in, in a ball. Yeah. I mean, he was good, but he was never a standout, like all-star type player. Um, but he was consistent. And he brought that to the big leagues and I mean, took off. You don't have to notice too. So a lot of the triple A stands, the most – the lighting doesn't seem to be as good as it is in those double A ballparks. I don't know. What, I don't know if you've noticed that. But I just remember it seemed the double A ballparks seem to be better lit. I don't know why, but you know, I get to some of these ballparks, you couldn't see right these triple A stands. Yeah, if you could hit in them, then you true. could hit in the big leagues because it's like hitting in broad daylight now for a I night know. game. I know, and I, a lot of hitters would say that too. I, I have, yeah, that's, that makes sense. I mean, I would only hear about it if I was pitching and hitters playing they can't see the ball, which obviously helped me. Um, but yeah, you, you get yeah maybe that's the case. I don't know. Well, now the stadiums I mean they're unbelievable. I mean you look at the minor league stadiums. It's, I mean it's an event. It's like they they trickle down from the big league parks all the way to the minor leagues, and it's like a family event. You bring your kids there. It's 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 fun to go to a game besides just the game, which you know is good and bad. But um, but yeah, it's crazy. You see a lot more of these major league teams buying or purchasing the, their minor league affiliates, I guess, so that they're able to yeah. put more money into it to be able to you know, prepare these guys to get them to, to the, to the big league level. You know, a lot of these teams yeah. playing, I mean, some of these but, teams we played aren't even there anymore. Yeah, I know. But the, the one thing still, and I know they're trying to adjust the the pay is atrocious. I mean, it, it was so, I mean, I remember my first year, if I didn't have my parents supporting me being a 19th round draft pick, not having any signing bonus at all, really. And going out the medicine hat and getting paid what, what I mean, 800 bucks a month before taxes. And then with a the host family that we had to pay with no, we had to stay with the host family. I think I cleared like 115 bucks every two weeks. And I was like, this is insane. Like I can hardly eat on this, let alone rent a place or, you know, it, it's crazy how, how brutal it was. And like I said, if I didn't have support, my family supporting me, like giving me some dollars here and there, and we didn't have any money um that's another reason guys i would see guys all the time even even top round draft picks that went to like pretty solid schools for education they would you know there's, there's this one guy in the local area von Schill. Sch i don't know if you remember him yep. he went to duke scored stop first rounder great player but after two years he was like screw this i'm gonna be uh one of the top notch financial planners in the whole tri-state area and he's he's uh, making a fortune doing that now but he was like you know i can't go through the myers this is too hard <laughs> <laughs> you're right. Yeah, you're right. And I know they, Major League Baseball, they had, they were talking about unionizing the minor league stuff. We were talking about it uh, yeah. before. It's, you know, it's difficult because some guys, you know, what side of the fence are you on with it? And that's, that's the hard part yeah. as far as, you know, the motivating guys to get to that level, right? To put, putting in the work. And you're right. Some of these guys, you know, aren't making anything. And it's tough for us when we were in school. We couldn't work in college, right? You couldn't do it. Right. You couldn't have a job. Now they've changed the, you know, the collegiate rules yeah. as far as the, what is it, the NIL, the NIL, NIL. stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, going to, you know, tampering. Now these kids are making money now. And then on top, then they get, say they get to Marley Ball. Now they're not making the money that they were mm -hmm. in college. So now what? Now what are they going to do? So, I mean, it's, 
You're right. It builds tricky. character. It builds the camaraderie because you're you're doing it together, right? We've, yeah. You see, I mean, heck, you've seen some of those spreads that people get. You've seen oh. the funny stuff that people they fight about, right? They get in there and they and they race in there and they fight and knock crap over, and then nobody ends up eating because people are too busy pouting and whining, and whining about stuff. Pe- peanut butter and banana sandwiches. I lived off those, and I was saying, I told this, I told somebody else this. So we also play in the double A. We would go to Chipotle. They didn't have them up north yet, and we get burritos. We cut them in half. So eat one for lunch, eat one for dinner. And that's what I ate every day because that's all we could afford. Um, it, it's crazy. It, it was absolutely nuts. Talk about building character. I mean, to this day, I mean, I haven't done anything that hard, but going through the mile lanes, it was, it was a challenge. But like I said, I had a lot of luck. Had a lot of great teammates. Like you said, camaraderie. I mean, it's like college, but times a thousand because you're you're on your own. There's no college structure. And I mean, I'm still best friends with some of the guys that played in the minor leagues today. So to this day, yeah, because it, it, you know, those are the ones that you know we're in the trenches with. You see, guys, you know, you have the the high school draft picks that are high picks with a lot of money, right? There's no structure, or you have the guys that are high draft picks, but they're college guys with a little bit more structure. I mean, you know, you've seen that we've we've been through with those guys that have, you know, that have done that and just blown everything right on yeah. random random crap. That guys have mm-hmm. spent money on, and it's because they don't have structure with, with it. So I mean, is so like you know, people they weigh the options: do I go to school? Do I not go to school? But I mean, you you went to school to go to school. You know, I didn't go to school yeah. to go to school. I went to school to, to play baseball, and class was just in the way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I did, and I graduated on time in four years with a computer science degree, like I said, and that's that's the best thing I ever did because I was done playing, and I was you know close to thirty. And thank God I didn't have to go back to get my undergrad as a 30 year old. Like I know a guy, one of my close friends, he went back at like 34 years old and so he had a year and a half left and he had to go back and sit in class at 34 and he had like a family and he's like, you know, it's really hard. And you're not just a kid in college, just, you know, having some fun. So it's, uh, it, it turned out to be the best thing I ever did. Um, and I was lucky enough to pitch a few years in the big leagues and kind of have that piece of my life too. So you talk about being, you talk about the analytics and being a nerd. Mm. So what are your yeah. thoughts on the analytics of these days? Are you, uh, are you an old school so player funny. or are you on, or which side are you on? Um, um, well, it's interesting. Cause I talked to Jeff about this quite a bit. Um, Cause when I talked to Jeff, I work in data analytics and data science. So that's what I do. I work in the clinical trial space and basically we build software that runs clinical trials. And a lot of our software uses kind of artificial intelligence, machine learning to kind of analyze data, data science. So that's the world I live in for the past, I mean, I've been involved in data science for the past six, seven years, but I've been involved in this vertical, this space of pharma for uh, since I got done playing. So it's interesting. So when I, about a few years back, I was looking at some jobs at Major League Baseball and I was like, okay, I have the data science background. Let me see if I can get a hold of somebody and see if there's a match somewhere. I don't know. I mean, because I know they don't pay that well. So I was just trying to figure things out. So again, back to your point about data science today and data analytics. So I couldn't get a sniff. I mean, I played in the big leagues. I have data science background. I couldn't get anybody to even talk to me. To this day, I still can't get anybody on the phone or I want an email. No, nobody responded to me, nothing. And I talked to Jeff about that. And it's and it's interesting. We talked about the job postings from Major League Baseball recently in the past couple of years. And it's like, okay, we're looking for these data scientists, which it's pretty, I work with some pretty hardcore nerds like that know much more than I do, way more intelligent than me. They go, they go to those Ivy League schools and they can crunch numbers like no other and really build data models and do some really cool stuff, especially with baseball statistics. Um, so we talk about the job description. It says, you know, no baseball knowledge needed whatsoever in these job descriptions. I'm like, that doesn't, I mean, I know they're feeding the data and the data analytics to people, supposedly baseball people, but I'm not seeing a whole lot of that. I'm seeing, you know, they're feeding the analytics, but they're not, the proper people aren't taking the analytics and kind of looking at it and seeing where they can apply it in the game. Some teams, maybe, I mean, I see some teams do things and I'm, I, I kind of, I don't watch a whole lot of games, but I kind of watch the the kind of the analytics piece cause I'm interested in it. So you bring up Jeff's name. Jeff's on one end of the, spe- the end of the spectrum. He's like the old boomer head. You know, he's like, he doesn't even probably know how to use an iPad where I'm a complete nerd. I'm on the tech side, but, I also don't agree with how it's being applied today because I know the Kevin Cash is the word. I play with him. I know Chris Woodward. I play with him, uh, who just recently got let go by the Rangers. But those guys, like, I always talk about that decision. I think you were talking about it with Zon, about taking out, uh, what's his name, in Tampa Bay. Cash took it out, uh, the pitcher in the World Series. Oh, Snell. Uh, So that whole scenario, I, I played with Kevin for years. There's no way... Kevin makes that move with his brain. There's there's just no 
way. And I'm watching that game and I'm like, what is going on here? Like, I don't care what the analytics say. You, there's, there's a certain, there's, a, there's some intangibles there as human beings. Like I work in data science, but I work with clinical trial endpoints and they're all like blood pressure, vitals. You can measure those and everybody has like certain, you know, parameters you stay in. In baseball, I was, t- I, t- I had this argument all the time about Juan Pierre and I'm going off in a tangent, but Juan Pierre versus Adam Dunn, who I would rather face. I faced both of them in double A quite a bit. And I hated facing Juan Pierre with the game on line because he would just slap at the ball, keep me on my toes, the nervous energy, not knowing if he got on first, he was going to steal second. And then I'm done. I never gave up many home runs, but I'm like, if he gets one, he gets one. But otherwise, I can get him out nine times out of ten where Juan Pierre, he's going to put the ball in play. I'm not going to strike him out. And you can't measure that. You can't measure when the stand – like I was talking about the uh, not too long ago where playing in Baltimore and Fenway, where Baltimore, I always felt like the fans, I could hear every fan everyone what they would say and they would like say some things and sometimes i'd be on the mound and be like are you kidding me like those types of things get in your head you can't measure these things during the game and that's why the whole money ball concept and my and i think Zon touched on this in your last podcast the money ball thing was great but again if you don't have the proper players and and well i mean money ball don't even get me started i mean they had a pitching staff that was stacked but um but there's something to it. But again, in the World Series and the playoffs, when the crunch time, when human the human element really comes into play and pressure comes in, you can't measure that. And that's why the A's never won. And that money ball philosophy is out the window. Once you get in the playoffs, it's a whole new game when the pressure's on. So that's kind of my thoughts on analytics and where things are today. I mean, I think there's a place. I mean, it's not going away. That's the best for like, like somebody like Jeff might say, get rid of it all. Get rid of the iPads. Get rid of everything. It's not it's not going away. These kids now, I mean, I have a two and a half year old, they're growing up with the technology, which I love because I'm a tech dork, but you got to find a happy medium because the game is just, I can't, I have trouble watching it. Besides a few players and and managers that I know, it's just, it's painful to watch. Yeah. It's the, it's that the older group of guys that we've, that we've been around. You talk about the hiring process. You see it, I think just in general now they come in so this is baseball okay you're a, com- you're a computer nerd they're talking about the analytics they want you to come in but you don't have any baseball knowledge basically we don't want you to have played or done anything we just want you to be this side so they it's, they probably almost as if they want to train them to do it their way right they're, they're taking away their thought process okay it's got to be this way only so then they can come in to learn and that i'm sure that's probably why it is bobby because you've played at that level they know mm-hmm. You know what you hear you how you think or what you want and they don't want that they don't want people to think and you, you refer to the money ball that you, it works but it doesn't work in a short series for what then they made right. it to what one alcs and they got swept by the tigers was the one the one year but other than that it just hasn't been it hasn't worked so i mean you're right there is a happy medium but at the same time it just the human element i mean heck they're going to talk about having robot umpires and everything else i mean uh-huh. Which stinks because you look at the pitchers like that I saw pitch when I was playing. I mean, some of those guys I, I, I grew up watching, I was able to see them live, like Clemens, Pedro, even like Maddox. And the zone, you know, I think you talked about it. You might have talked about it with Zone. He was talking an awful lot about, you know, the zone and, and like pitchers that have been around. They get they got the respect of the umpires. They deserve to get some – I mean, they got some pitches. Like when I got to the big leagues, I, I can still remember games like there yesterday where I throw pitches right down the middle and they would call a ball. And because so-and-so is out to play like Manny – and I'm like, that's a ball. I'm like, basically, you're letting. It, I mean, as a rookie, you don't get any calls at all. And it, that was that was, but you kind of learned. It was kind of part of the game in terms of the respect factor, and, and you know, being a rookie versus a veteran. There was a really strong, and it all worked out. That that kind of build, kind of break you down, to build you up type thing. And um, so yeah, it's 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 interesting how because I often say like me and Jeff talk, and Jeff's, you know, a little older than me, but at the same time, I just my last year was 2004. Like I mean. It was not like it was 50 years ago. Like I'm not some boomer. I mean, it was only like 17 years ago, not even. So it's like, you know, the game changed that much in that many years. I mean, 2004, it wasn't like this. And you had guys was was Doc there when you were in Toronto? Yeah, well, Doc, Doc, me and Doc. Yeah, we were we were pretty close for a little bit. Um, his 2001 year, my rookie year, was the year he was bought halfway up through. He was sent down the A ball like to reinvent yep. himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, he came up at the, after the All Star break, my rookie year. So that was the first time I played on the same team as him, um, and got to know him well. And his story, I mean, what a crazy story! I mean, his first outing back in the big leagues after going through all that, you know, minor league reinvention, he gave up nine earned runs in that third of an inning. And I remember being like, his career is over. And then they started on the next series, and I think he went on to win nine wins in a row. And 
the rest is history. He went on to be a Hall of Famer. Was, Car- <laughs> was Chris Carpenter there with you, or was he yeah, already in St. Louis? Chris Carpenter was – my rookie year, I was 24. I was the youngest guy on the team. They were they were in contention. I mean, I, I came up, and I was the only rookie on the team, which you know how that could be with a veteran team. That's fun, um, getting hazed by multimillionaires. But, um, but yeah, I had Delgado, Plezak, Quantrill. And then we, I mean, we had a bunch of heavy hitters on that team, which, which was pretty good team, Mondesi. Um, so it was, it was fun, but it was, uh, had its own challenge. <laughs> but, so learning, so you're in a big league, learning to pitch from those guys. Did you, you know, yeah. sit there and watch a guy like how, yeah. like Doc, Doc would, you know, almost pitch backwards to a point of where you just never knew. And did you, you know, learning from him, learning from those guys that were, that had been around, you know, do you, do yeah. You know, I mean, for me in a bullpen, like Quantrill, please act those two on the left and right side. And Quantrill was, I can say he'd be the, probably the biggest guy I looked up to in terms of mentorship because he was a sinker baller really only threw one pitch his entire career. People don't really realize that, um, but he, he had such great control that he could do, he would just show other pitches. And I mean, he played, I don't know how many years in the big leagues, but then please, I was the same way. Then Billy Koch was there, which a little crazy, a little nutty as a closer. But um, again, we, we were pretty tight. And I, I was lucky enough, you mean, you get to the big league level, you're talking about guys like Quantrill and please, I've been in the big leagues for over 10 years already. And I'm like, wow, taking in all this knowledge and me being the nerd, like taking it all and just t- saying like, okay, I can do this, this, and this. And I, I mean, I, quite frankly, I look back at it. If these analytics were available for me then, I think it would have been too much for me. It would have been information overload because I would overanalyze everything. And I think I would have probably gotten some trouble because I would, I would think like, like I did get in some trouble when I would look at players like Manny Ramirez. Oh, I faced him seven times, struck him out five times. But then the last time I faced him, he's got to be looking inside here or he's got to be looking for the slider. So let me try to go away. And then he hits a 700 foot home run off me. So if I had analytics and I was looking at data, I think I would like overthink the situation with my mind, the, the way I look at things. But, uh, but again, it's, it's interesting how much has changed over the years, but the that Toronto team in 2001 was great. I mean, they were really good to me as a whole. Jeff was on that team, Jeff Fry. I mean, he had a, he had a notorious reputation for being rough with rookies, but he, he was great with me. I never had an issue with him and, and he actually took care of me quite a bit. So you, you talk about being the baseball nerd. Doc was definitely the baseball nerd, Yeah, right? He 100%. was that first, really that one guy that during our generation, that was, you could tell he was just, he was above and beyond what he was doing as far as the work ethic when it came yeah. to that my my goal like when i when i played with doc i used to run with him which was a mistake him and carpenter i would try to go run meanwhile i'm a reliever they're starters they're trying to go run steps throughout the sky dome and uh i would try to go running with them and i couldn't lift my legs and i had to pitch that night but my goal was always to outwork doc like doc had a notorious reputation but so did i in that organization i was a nobody compared to doc eventually but um but my goal was to always outwork him and that was my running kind of because i looked at him as the ultimate big leaguer in terms of work ethic. The guy was was an animal when he worked. His, and it's known he was a, he had great work ethic, and that and that's where I kind of looked at him as as kind of like that guiding kind of force in terms of work ethic, what you need to do. And, and Chris Carpenter was a workhorse too. And Kelvin Escobar was there. He was a workhorse. These guys, I mean, worked their tails off. And you know, you see a little bit in the minor leagues like that because guys are kind of on their own or at the time were kind of up to their own. But the guys that really separated themselves were the guys that really kind of took that work ethic to another level, made it consistent. And, um, you know, I was lucky to come up with a team that had great guys had been around and really had great work ethics to really kind of model myself after. You're talking about, you're talking about Halliday and, and, and everything else. This, that's that whole story. I mean, people probably don't know, you know, he, that he, did he send himself down to a ball? Did he ask to no, go down or what, no, was, no, he, what, what was that whole? Yeah, he, he was a big, big time draft pick out of high school like first rounder i don't know what what pick he was but uh, he threw really over the top like right over the top and he threw like a like at the time a true 98 99 like hard and he got called up i think in 99 and he pitched pretty well a couple outings with i think for gozi was the manager but then he came up some rough times and they sent him back to the minor leagues and started like you know put him back put him for and then you know he really started to get a lit, lit up pretty bad and I think it was 2000, the end of 2000. And then I don't know if it was whenever he, he was told that, listen, we're going to drop you down to three quarters. We're going to do this experiment because he was on his like last leg and Mel queen who has since passed away, but he was like a pitching guru. He taught me like a cutter. I mean, this guy 50, 60 years in the game. And he took holiday as like one-on-one and again, first rounder, he gets some kind of love. I wouldn't get love like this, but holiday gets go back to a ball and kind of march through a double A and triple a, at this new arm angle and he did relatively well he picked it up pretty quickly it took him a half season 
And then he came, like I said, came to the big leagues. And his first outing gave up nine and runs in a third of an inning. I was like, oh, my goodness. And then the rest is history. I mean, he he really adopted the consistent, but his work ethic and his and his mental kind of capacity to to really make that adjustment. I mean, it says a lot, and that's why the guy was who he was. I mean, he he had that you know that kind of bulldog mentality and that that kind of you know saved his career. And he went on to be a Hall of Famer, which I'm not surprised. Yeah, he was Doc was definitely he was a quiet guy. You know, I played with oh, him in uh, 2008. Super. You know, he was he's a, he was a quiet, really just a quiet guy. But there were some some other guys that were uh, that were there. You know, Vernon was still there. Uh, AJ yeah. Burnett, guy who's really out <laughs> outspoken. You know, very, just boisterous guy. You know, and just learning. But I think just sitting there, the way he said Doc just carried himself. He was yeah. he was different in that mentality. You know, just watching even the younger guys watched him. I, uh, oh, yeah. uh, even the younger guys that were there, I think Jesse Litch was a guy that was there. Uh, oh, yeah. so I, so in 2003, I broke Doc's leg. I hit a line drive off of his, oh, right. sh- off of his shin yeah. and the ball right. did not go. A ball dropped straight to the ground. He threw it. He, he threw me out at first. And I remember Frankie Menachino was at second base, just laughing. Yeah. Just laughing. Yeah. I think I was at that. I was it, at that game because I was, I was on the DL. It was okay. So, yeah. It was in Arlington. I hit it, and it and yeah, yeah. a millimeter either way. His leg doesn't break. And he probably goes on to win the Cy Young. And so when I got to Toronto, uh, I'd ask the guys, I said, yeah, I, I broke Halliday's leg that year. And uh, we went to look for it. And that was the only video that was scrubbed from the system. Doc had had it taken out of the system. But, yeah, that year I remember that because I called over. And you feel bad. You know, you're, you're doing that kind of oh, stuff. Yeah. You call over there and just, you just want to check on him to see what happened. Uh, but, yeah, a millimeter. That, that ball just That's dropped right. straight down. Yeah, and his leg broke that year, and I just – and the funny thing was that he had hit me, I think, That's previously funny. in the year and tore tore some ligaments and top my hand with that sinker that he would throw. Oh, there you that go. That power sinker. So, oh, there you go. Um, but yeah, but yeah, no, he was. That was the only thing. But those guys always had asked that question. I never asked Doc about that. Why he uh, why he scrubbed all that? But the guys, I think it was just, uh, just his mentality of uh, you know probably just putting yeah. it away from. Him. So, I don't know. Maybe urban legend a little bit. I don't know. Doc uh, Doc was really introverted, really quiet. I mean, he didn't. There was nothing. He didn't do anything off the field at all. I mean, I wasn't a big guy going out. Like I wasn't that. I was a, again. I was the nerd, kind of always focused on staying in the big leagues. And Doc, I mean Carpenter, that whole group that, of guys that kind of hung out. They were just focused on baseball, and that's it. I mean, you know, you have different cliques in the clubhouse and things like that. And Doc was really. I mean, he opened up a lot more later in his career. I think with younger players in terms of like being a mentor. But when I played with him, it was more. You know, he was just so introverted that having a conversation with him was something that was awkward. Um, but again, he came out of high school. He's so young. I can't imagine coming out of high school playing in the minor leagues and going to the big leagues. I, I, um, I, it's hard enough as a college graduate, let alone a high school kid. Um, but again, he he really, I mean, he turned the corner that 2001 year. And then 2003 and like four, that's when, I mean, he really took off in Toronto. And uh, yeah, I forgot you played with him in Toronto. That's right. Or <laughs> for a short period Who was of time. your pitching coach? Was it Arnie? With Brad Arnsberg? Oh, yeah. I mean, he was my pitching coach at AAA for a little bit when I was hurt. Uh, the Mark Connor was the pitching coach. Okay. He was the pitching coach in the Yankees for a lot of years. And then Gil Patterson worked the bullpen coach when I, my good years there. And then Arnie kind of got called up. What was that, 2004? Was he the pitching coach? I don't even know who the pitching coach was in 2004. It was such a circus. Um, again, because I, I was the youngest player in 2001 on the team. And then by 2004, I was the old, one of the oldest players at 27. I mean, they cleared house. J.P. Richard actually cleared the entire house. I mean, everybody was gone. Um, and they gave a lot of young guys opportunities, like Jason Fraser. I don't know if you played with him yeah. a little bit. I think he played with him. Yeah, yeah. good guy. Um, but ultimately, it just uh, it was a different clubhouse completely. Who was managing then? Was it Gibby? No, it was Tosca, Carlos Tosca. That's right, Carlos Tosca. And then John I had never, nothing against. I mean, he was all right. I, I just I was I was battling injury after injury at that point, and it was like it didn't matter who the manager. It was. I mean, my rookie year was Buck Martinez. He came right out of the booth and jumped into being a manager, which I can't say enough good things about. He gave me an opportunity. They literally released a veteran reliever just so I could make the roster, and that was unheard of back then um, because I had three options left. Yeah. So, that, oh, yeah, the the old option game now. Oh, my goodness. Mm-hmm. Trying to up down the old taxi squad. They're doing that to guys. That, you know, I remember those days. Mm-hmm. As soon as you get called up and you got to go back down and everything else, right? Those are, you know, guys, it's it's Terrible. tough, right? Especially if, you know, new regimes coming in manager-wise and you're starting from mm-hmm. there. You just hope that a lot of stuff doesn't change, right? Because you're so used to it, especially at that level of what guys go through. You know, coaches know you and all of a sudden they're bringing in new guys. Now they're hiring guys just, like you said, right out of the booth that have no managerial mm-hmm. experience at all. And uh, 
so sometimes some of the guys don't have the respect just because they play doesn't mean that they should be coaching at that 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 level right that major league level. well you look at some of the managers now i mean you know i was just thinking about this earlier like i know rocco bedell he's still, still the manager of Minnesota. Yep. I mean, he was a pretty badass player um i can see him being a good manager um i didn't know him that well personally but i played against him a lot and i thought i always thought he was a great player and a really tough nose player but then you look at like the mets i mean Buck Showalter, I mean, look what they're doing this year. There's something to it with these veteran managers that know baseball. If you can kind of have a mix of the two, I just think it's it's interesting right now. You look at teams like – I think you were talking about this in one of your podcasts. I'm a big fan. Um, with Oakland. I mean, they're hitting as a team, like something ridiculous. And I'm like, this is unbelievable. How does this happen? I, I mean, some of these guys would never even come close to double A, let alone the big leagues. I, I just don't understand – because the pitching's not – It's it's only been, you know, 15, 16 years since I played. The pitching hasn't gotten that much better. I'm sorry. In 15, 16 years. The guys aren't all of a sudden all throwing 150. Um, just not – this doesn't work that way. I can tell by hitters' reactions if a guy's truly throwing 100 or not. Um, at least 100 in my kind of day uh, with the stalker guns. But, yeah, it's interesting. I, I don't know what the answer is because I know Jeff is going down a rabbit hole of really, you know, going after – the gurus and the hitting and pitching gurus that are out there that are really, cause I see it at the, at the amateur level and it's kind of taught a certain way, the way baseball should be played. And it kind of trickles, you know, it all trickles up. So, uh, you know, it's unfortunate cause I grew up, you know, playing the game, loving baseball. Now I find myself why I'd rather watch playoff basketball or football. Yeah, it is. It's, it is difficult to watch. Even like you said, at, at the younger age of these kids of not, mm -hmm. it's almost painful you to walk over and go, well, yeah, you, you want to help, but at the same time, you don't want to, you know, how do you, you hurt somebody's feelings, but you're right. It's tough because you want, you, you want it to be done the right way. And there's not, there's no one perfect way, but when you're right. trying to sell people on, on bullshit, that's the worst yeah. part, right? You're just, uh, you know, I, well, you're like you, you're six foot four. We can't teach a kid that's five, eight to pitch like you did, right? You right. can't teach someone to hit like Aaron judge you have to teach and that's the hard part it's like like a teacher and coaching you have to individualize each yeah thing so that's that, why it's tiring yes it's exhausting as a coach and teacher like if you treat each individual to their individual strengths but good coaches good teachers are, do that but then the ones that are terrible just blanket teach the same to everybody and i've seen it across you know any type of business really including baseball where you know, that's what one thing that really riles Jeff and everybody up is the fact that you have these hitting coaches teaching one way to swing and attack the baseball, where Juan Pierre is not going to attack the baseball like Adam Dunn is. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Um, that's just common sense to me. I don't, I don't, same thing with pitching. Like you said, you have a 6'4 pitcher, and then you have like another kind of, you know, smaller guy like a Marcus Stroman. I mean, he pitched totally different. I, uh, you just, you know, it's, 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 it's disheartening because this is the highest level of sport at baseball, the major league level. And you're seeing this kind of like common sense kind of thrown out the window. Um, and I don't know why it kind of really exponentially got worse over the past, like five years, really five to seven years when I saw like a huge change. I mean, I would get the package, MLB package just to watch some games, quite frankly, watch like managers I knew and coaches I knew. And I would see these games and I know everybody says strikeouts and home runs. That's all it's been. But you watch a game and you see some of these hacks, one two oh two hitters take. I'm like, what are you doing? I said, I, 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 you're swinging so hard that you're falling out of the box with two strikes. I mean, I would love to pitch today. Give me a break. Nobody pitches inside. First of all, no one goes near the inner half. I was talking about. I was watching a tw Twitter th thread this morning and yesterday about Judge, and yeah, he's a monster. He's a great player, obviously. But how many people really buzz him and knock him off the plate? I, I don't know. I haven't watched enough of his at bats, but you got to make him feel uncomfortable that player of that caliber. I mean, cause otherwise he's just going to get those arms extended and he's, he launches balls the other way, like 500 feet. So I just think the pitching and, and the umpires made it difficult to pitch inside too. I know that like you, one guy pitches inside, knocks the guy down, the teams get a warning. And then next, next thing you know, you try to do it, you get thrown out of the game. So I, that, that has changed to the way pitchers pitch inside. I don't see, like, I don't see pitching anymore. I see more throwing. No. Guys sitting yeah, well, up outside and missing by three feet, a ball up and in, catcher set up out off the plate, 0-2, yeah. and you're missing up and in, right? off somebody, somebody got hit in the face the other day with an 0-2 fastball that was set up for a way. Yeah. I mean, how do you miss by that much? At that level, I can understand an yeah. eight-year-old missing by that much, but not a major league pitcher. That's the thing. Right. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Are they gonna, when are they going to go back to learning to actually pitch? instead of just trying to throw it as hard. Granted, there are some guys that can do it, but everything you see online, mm -hmm. increasing, well, I can do it this way. But they're not even looking Pretty at their slow. target for a second, and all of a sudden it's just basically arm, and they're just flailing and letting ball. Okay. It's like uh, 
was major league, right? He's throwing yeah. it in the back of the net. Vince Vaughn yeah, or, exactly. Yeah. That's what it seems like is being taught. Yeah, well, I tell you what, some of the training, having been big in like fitness and training myself, um, some of the training for throwing the baseball has been pretty advanced. Um, I, I kind of, I'm not, I'm not opposed to any of it. I long toss the shit out of the ball. Like I would long toss three, four hundred feet. That's how I strengthen my arm. But that being said, there is some really cool things they're doing with pitchers in terms of velocity, in terms of things like that. But you know, you have these great athletes with great arms, and they're teaching them to throw as hard as possible. But for me, like I, at my peak, I could throw 95, 96 miles an hour. But I knew to be effective at the major league level, and even in the minor leagues. I would throw 91, 92 with sync and I could be a better pitcher. Like if I threw four seamers, I think it, in my career, I'd try to blow a guy away maybe two or three times. I think two times I gave up home runs with a four seam fastball. Um, and it, it's, I just never did max effort like that because, you know, you were trying to light up the scoreboard, trying to do things like that. Um, it was just different. And I learned how to pitch with what I had, but I don't, I don't know if you're, I mean, you'll see guys that can pitch and throw hard and they're the ones that are going to be superstars. I mean, that's, that's what's going to happen. And I think eventually people say the game will come full circle. Maybe. I mean, if you had a guy like Juan Pierre, I keep going to Juan Pierre because I was so impressed with his game for so many years in the minor leagues. I mean, you have a guy like that that caused that much disruption on the base pass and just at the, at the plate, just as a little like slap hitter. I mean, that will, that will, I mean, I mean, just in terms of, you know, getting your team fired up. I mean, you have a guy like that at the top of the order. It's uh, that's what's missing. I mean, there's a couple guys like that out there, but uh, but again, it's it's few and far between. Yeah, you don't see those. You don't see it. I want Pierre guy bunting to get on a smaller mm -hmm. guy. You know, um, who's the guy? The, the kid from uh, Cincinnati that could just flat out fly. When he would only hit about two fifty, two sixty, but he could. I can't think of his name. The center field. No, Ryan Friel. I'm Ryan Friel that played with him. Oh, yeah, not Ryan. Not, yeah, Ryan Friel. wasn't that Friel. fast. I, I lived live with Friel in the Arizona Fall League, by the way, when we played there together. It's uh, I Talk can't, about, but you know what I mean? You, you don't see those guys. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. those, that was back when guys would run through walls. You know, he was one of those. He guys. literally would run into, and the guy was, talk about a gamer, times a thousand. I mean, I live with him. And I, that's, I got to know Ryan really well. Him and Chris Keller. I don't remember Chris Keller. He threw like a hundred. I remember um, the name. Yeah. He was with Detroit. He threw like a hundred, playing the big ones a little bit. Him and Ryan were childhood friends. And they wind up coming up, and we live together. I live with those two in Arizona, which talk about a mix of personalities. Me being me, and then those two crazy guys. Um, but yeah, Ryan. I mean, his mentality was. I mean, he can get. He played like twelve years in the minor leagues or ten years in the minor leagues before he got to the big leagues. Um, talk about a grinder and just like a gamer. I mean, they'll make him like that. No, you don't. You don't. Those guys that we're writing, especially now, you know, guys are only putting in a year to ah, I'm going to something else. Right? Well, you look at the money. I mean, you look at the financial side of the game, and this is kind of blows. It doesn't blow my mind because I look, I, I've done pretty well for myself after baseball, but at the same time, I know how hard I have to work to make a certain amount of dollars. And if you got, if you're getting paid, I mean, the minor league, the major league minimum, I think, I, I think it's like six, 700 now. I mean, that, that's some serious money now. And it was good when we played, but it wasn't that to where you could play a couple of years and really do some right things with your money and you could be okay for a little bit. And I think if these guys that get these contracts, I don't care who you are, you're human. You get a contract, you're, you're, you're locking in a couple million dollars a year, even for the worst reliever in the big leagues. I mean, you know, you're going to play, you're going to get, if you can get 10 years and great, cause you get the pension, but otherwise you're going to play enough to have that kind of nest, that, that, that nest egg. And then uh, why not? Why not go on to the next thing? Cause it's a grind playing baseball for a living. And uh, if you're, if you're, I mean, there's, there's guys who will play forever, like the pool holes of the world. But again, there's other guys. You'll see a lot of guys drop out after about ten to ten year mark, and they're done. Yeah, get the full pension. Oh yeah, it's uh, my first year. I think it was two hundred thousand was a league minimum. Dude, me too. Yeah, yeah, and then it went up the next year. I think oh three, it went up to three hundred. Yeah, and that's what I mean. It went so, up three hundred. I know, yeah. and I had a great rookie year, and it went up, and they said, "Well, that's your raise." I'm like, "That's bullshit." Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So I mean, which that's I mean, coming from Philly. I mean, that was some serious money. I remember I was telling somebody I had $300 in my bank account when I made it to the big leagues, 300 bucks to my name. And on my first check, I think I cleared 12 K two week check. I remember being like, this is unreal. Oh yeah. And it's funny what guys will go out and some of those guys go out and spend it. I mean, heck you right there. You go out, go out to AC I for a little bit. Huh? Loans with it. Huh? <laughs> I, paid off, I paid off my student loans. Well, yeah. It. Now you don't have to, everything's free I nowadays. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> oh man but, yeah but things have changed since we were since we were growing up though so it's but hopefully, it wasn't that long ago no it wasn't but it, it wasn't, just seemed like know? it though maybe our bodies yeah. feel our bodies feel 
older than what it should, right? Well, it's funny. It's, uh, it's crazy. I mean, do you remember how we met in the Fall League, the Arizona Fall League? I do. Was that, oh, like 2000 or 2001? 2000. What team were you with? In f- I was with Scottsdale. Okay, yeah, so we were right there because we were at the Rafters. Because I played with Koplov. Did you play with Koplov in high school? I played with I mean, Koplov college? at Delaware. He He's was such a, a yeah. baseball man. Yep. Yeah, I grew up with him, playing against him growing up. Um, he was a shortstop, too. He never really pitched much um, until high school and college. But, uh, but yeah, so we, we met in the fall league, and you won't remember this, but um, I was, at the time, we were going out. Like, some nights we went out. I didn't go out a whole lot, but living with Friel, it was like occasionally we'd go out to the, I think it was called the Sanctuary, if you remember that yep. place. Yep, yep. Um, <laughs> so so I, I was being, like, recruited by all the agencies. You know, they're like vultures out there, all the, all the big uh, agents. Are, are trying to cherry pick guys in the fall league that don't have agencies. I had a small agent out of Philly, like not nobody um, that had a couple guys, but these, these agencies like IMG, Beverly Hills sports council, they were like coming hard at me because they're like, these are prospects. So it would take me out to dinner. And it's funny. The one night IMG was like wine and dining me, taking me out to the clubs, dr- free everything. It was like, I was like, this is great, but I don't drink a whole lot. And I still don't. And I was pretty banged up. And I remember um, at the sanctuary, we almost got this huge fight. Some guys like, and I remember you came over and you grabbed a dude that was in front of me and threw him up against the wall. And you were like, that's enough. You, I, you squashed everything. And I remember being like, didn't you go to Delaware? And that's how we met. And that's how, that's the first time I met you. I'll never forget it. Cause I'm like, you saved my ass. Cause I would probably got knocked out or something. And I, I remember that like it was yesterday. Oh my gosh. That fall league team that we had, we had some, we had some knuckleheads oh. come through there on. Cause you know, cause that, Explain to people that have each team's broken down to about five organizations how it was set up because we were we were the rafters and, and you were Scottsdale so we shared a stadium right there in downtown mm-hmm. Scottsdale so we only lived I think two streets up yep. um, with the guys I think we had Kansas City Minnesota San Francisco and I'm not sure one more so you had to so you know it's telling people these teams are broken down so you send what four or five guys from each one and you're right you have different different avenues of guy different level we had a guy Mike Curry. And uh, we were out one night, probably at the sanctuary, and we were we were leaving. I don't know how we made it home. We did a hundred plus miles an hour, and I don't think I had a chance to get my seatbelt on. Ran every light, and I don't know how we didn't end up dying being out there because you're 20 years old, right? You're 21 years old. Yeah. You're out there. You've got nothing to do, and you know you're just out with your buddies playing baseball, and you're having a good time doing it. And that's the stuff that people that the people don't see uh, anymore. Yeah, it's it's only good well, for one trip too. The fall league's it's good crazy. For one. Oh yeah, yeah. There's no traveling. And, and that fall league team. I mean, for me, I mean, I got the me and Pujols became pretty close during that because like, he was he was not in the big league yet. He was a they were they were experimenting with him at third base in the outfield at first base, and uh, we used to meet every morning at LA Fitness out there at nine nine thirty work out together. Me and him for the whole seat the whole fall league. Uh, great dude. I mean, unbelievable person. Uh, and then that whole team, like Chad Hutchinson was on my team. Like I remember playing like hacky sack in the clubhouse with him. I'm like, this guy was an, it's going to be an NFL quarterback. He was a stud. Um, but a lot of those guys, I mean, talk about, you, you, you take all the double A best athletes in the, in the entire minor leagues and you put them in fall league with some other sprinkled in prospects, even though I had some big league time. I mean, the league was super competitive, but, uh, but yeah, looking back at that team, that was, a, that was a great time. I mean, Gibbons, John Gibbons, was my manager out there, which that's where I got to know Gibby. Yep, it's a uh, good manager. We had good manager, which was great. I mean, it was great. It was a it was a great league for me. I mean, that again, that was that kind of that league cemented my time to get to the big leagues because I did really well out there. And, and you know, you do well in the fall league, you kind of put yourself on the map for sure. Even the coaching staff, ours. Uh, I mean, heck, our yeah. hitting coach Kevin, good old chicken head Kevin Long, is now oh, with yeah. the Yankees. I think he's there. Butch Wanager yeah. was our manager. He was, uh, I think, somebody made AAA and then. Oh gosh, I can't remember who our pitching coach was, but we had some some uh, some knuckleheads. Yeah. So I, you're talking about Chad Hutchinson. I saw him. He threw he threw for 300 yards here in Dallas against Jacksonville. I, saw him. I was at that game to go see that. Yeah, I, dude, I don't know if you remember. I don't know if you were part. Of, I was talking about this to a buddy of mine not too long ago. We used to play those pickup basketball games at night at LA Fitness during the fall league at night. We would. I don't know if you're involved in any of those. No, I was uh, at the bar. After One of the, the guys from the fall league, Chad Hutchinson, talk about a, a, a monstrous athlete. Him, Brandon Inge. Brandon Inge was another guy. The guy could that guy literally lit up and dunked over Mark Henderson in the fall league during like a pickup game. And Mark Henderson played in the NBA. I mean, and he was like, and Brandon Inge was like five foot ten. I mean, he was a little guy. Um, but yeah, that whole team. I mean, we play these basketball games. Even Pools, we play these basketball games. 
and talk about athletes, man. I mean, it was unreal. I mean, I was okay at basketball, but these guys, I mean, some of these guys were going up and just double handing dunking over guys. Like, and we're doing this during the fall league season. We have games the next day. It was pretty, I said that minor league mentality still. It, it, it definitely better than having to go to instructional league or go to oh, go play winter ball no. or something. But you're right. The, the amount of talent that came, that came through there, especially even our, that year that we were there, but you know, I'm talking oh, about, yeah. we had to go, I had to go back the next year and play. And I was up in, we were up in Peoria, which is, no, oh, yeah, that's where you didn't want to be, especially that because you're all the way out in the middle of nowhere, having to go for yeah. games up there to, to play. Um, I remember oh. we played in, in Mesa one night we were playing and remember he sopped Choi. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. With, with, with the, I think it was the Dodgers with the Great Cubs. Season. I think it was the Cubs. Yeah, with the Cubs. Cubs. Yep. And uh, he hit a ball off Joaquin Benoit off that metal <laughs> backstop out there. And it hit that wall and came back, bounced back to second base, hitting the ball so hard. <laughs> and there, like you said, those are some big time guys that were, that are out in the fall league playing that had, and these were the guys that were going to make the jump. A lot of them went to the big league. Oh, Albert yeah. went to the big leagues next year. He was rookie of the year. Mikey went to the big leagues from our team that year. Cool uh, Hulse was rookie of the year. I think so. Yeah. Because that, that was 2000. Yeah, I think yeah, 01. He was, yeah. He was oh, one, 20 yeah. years old at that time. I remember yeah. seeing out because we always saw you. We were always on the field together out there, yeah. you know, hanging out with people. I remember telling them the first night we played there in the fall league, uh, we're playing, I think we were probably playing you guys. And I hit a foul ball and it uh, hit some lady right in the ribs. We were talking about this. And then I think the next at bat, I th the same woman back came flat out of my hand and it hit her in the back of the head. Mm -hmm. And I felt so no. bad about that walk down there i think i, I think that next about i think i can tell you I hit a home run so as i went down the next thing i actually signed the bat and gave it to her i said i'm so sorry you're never gonna want to come back to another baseball game because because of this That's and you hilarious. wouldn't draw a lot of fans out there would you it was just more yeah. it was just more for us but we had we had fun right doing that stuff because yeah. you knew you were on the cusp of where you could go from there and grant some guys yeah, i don't think you really even knew how close you really were like i didn't i was a little too naive still like you knew it was great league you knew everybody but you, for me it was like the big league was such a stretch still in my mind like it was like you know hitting the lottery like the chances are so slim in my scenario and playing in the fall league i think i was still naive like i didn't know how close i really was like i was you know after the fall league got put on the roster on the 40 man and that was like a big big deal but at the time it's like okay yeah great um but i still had to march ahead and kind of you know try to get there but i mean that league I mean, it's the best kept secret for fans. I mean, if you want to go watch some of the best future players at a game, I don't know if it's still, I'm guessing it's still the same way. You go to the whole league, there's nobody at games. You, get a, you can sit front row and watch some of the best players in all the game, future players. We actually, in 2000, we won it that year. And it came down to the last games of the year. That was, we were, I think we were in a three-way tie. And coaches were offering the other teams money. If you guys go lose this game. I know, to and, lose. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we ended we were, up winning. We were up there too. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, you, you don't want to make the playoffs in minor league baseball. You're like, why do you want to? We made it because our teams were so good coming up through the minor leagues. I remember even in the fall league and the, in the Florida State League, we went to the championship and you had to play all the different rounds in the five game series. And, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a couple more weeks of getting paid shit money, if not nothing. And it's a grind and none of the stats count to who's going to see you unless they come to the actual games. Like, I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm mixed on minor league uh, playoffs. I don't think there should be any, quite frankly, because there's no incentive for guys. There's camaraderie there, but in terms of winning in the minor leagues, it's not like the big leagues where winning is everything. The minor leagues, it's kind of like, like especially a full league. Who wants to play extra games and win a full league championship? I mean, I mean, you got one. Maybe it's cool. I don't know. Oh, hell don't no. Know. They gave us jackets. And I gave my yeah. jacket away that day. They don't. They need to. They need to go retroactive and give us rings for it because we had to stay. Yeah. We yeah. stayed because the next day they ran out of whoever we beat in the next game. We beat. We won both games, but they ran out of pitching, so we only played I think seven innings. So it was one of those really. We had to stay two extra days for this. Yeah. End up with a jacket. It said fall. So somebody in the United States has a my Arizona Fall League championship jacket. And it probably wasn't even anything on. I think they just handed it to us and I gave it away. We wanted <laughs> rings at that point. You know, you're right because you're running into October. Yeah. Like, oh gosh. And then if you're playing winter ball or if you're you training for, you know, big league camp, I would go down to big league camp in January and because it was so cold up here when I had some funds to do it, but it was, uh, yeah, it just doesn't make sense to me in the minor leagues to have, because, because I mean, I did it a couple of years and we would stay an extra two weeks and it was just, you know, wear and tear on your arm too. Yeah. Uh, and your body, especially position players, especially in that Florida state league where the heat just <laughs> crushes you. Um, but yeah, that's just my thoughts on it. Cause I, I think back to, you know, the end of the seasons are super long, especially early on in my league, like low A ball and, and, 
in high A where those games, I mean, it's the first time you're playing like 150 games in a season. And it's a grind. Just going to the park every day, it's a, it's a grind that every day. And there's no off days in the minor leagues. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 it, it was tough. It might not be the same now. I mean, it might be a little more kind of, they seem to be more, a little more player focused in terms of their health and well being. Yeah, but they're still, they're still, you know, riding buses everywhere. That was the worst part, uh, but you know, you're right. You just, yeah, you've got to go from, like you said, Columbus, Georgia to, you know, Hagerstown, Maryland to play in a playoff game or, and whatnot. You just, you just, uh, you know, you you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. You just, oh, gosh. Can, does, well, double A, we went from, we went from Knoxville to Greenville, South Carolina. It was eight hours one way. And we would, I don't know who made the schedule at the time, but we played two games in Knoxville, two games in Greenville, two games in Knoxville, two games in Greenville. So after every second game, we're driving eight hours. And, you know, these games, you know, you, you drive through the night. You're done. You get on the bus at 11, 12 o'clock at night. You get in at 8 in the morning. You just try to sleep a couple hours. You're all screwed up. And then you have to play games. And in my situation, I was closing. And there's some games I remember in the minor leagues. I would come in a game. I'm like, I'm half asleep. I'm like, this is, you need to get fired up. And, you know, you don't realize when you have to be so consistent and good to make it to the next level. I mean, the lifestyle of those bus rides and those the travel was was crazy. I mean, it was, it was, it was it's unheard of. Yeah, people wanted you wanted the sleeper buses. What they had, I think only one team had sleepers that we knew of, which, which would have been oh, Arkansas, really? the Angels it was double Darden team with Jordan. Yeah, well, yeah, he bought them a team bus, but that heck, that was yeah, not, I, I don't know if they made sleepers when he bought bought that thing back in what ninety three or something. I know. I'll have, I mean, to, ask, I'll have to ask uh, Francona. Tito was, I think, was his manager that year. I know guys that played with him too, like John Ratliff. Guys that played were ahead of me. They they done the great things. Yeah, and that's just. And that's what it is. You don't you don't see that anymore. Those guys aren't coming down buying buses for for teams and everything else. You're you're putting in the work and and those long bus rides, just talking to Bussy, right? And those uh, we were talking, Mahal was talking about his bus. They bus is breaking down, and you're out there trying to. You just oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. I mean, imagine now, like going on an eight hour bus ride, and you have like a full series of Breaking Bad to watch. I mean, on your iPad. I mean, that'd be pretty. Makes it a lot easier. I would think so. Yeah. I think a little bit. It does. It just. You know, the times were different when we were there. We were playing cards. Guys were losing money, you know, playing cards and everything else, right? That's how you were interacting. You weren't texting the guy next to you. Instead, you were actually having a conversation. Yeah, we played a lot of chess. I was in the nerd. I the nerd click. Chess, we played. I mean, talk about some great chess players. Man, there's some smart dudes I played with. Really? I feel. I figured you for an erector set guy. You were that guy growing up, too. Yeah, definitely. Building with that stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, they yeah. don't make them like you anymore. Bobby, they just, they don't, you know, nowadays everybody does the work for them. Here's Ryan Rector said, yeah, yeah, somebody well, build that for I me. Mean, it's, yeah, it's a slippery slope. I mean, me just having a child two and a half years ago, it's like, okay, what direction are we going here? I mean, it's, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you, you sound like such an old man saying so the generation ahead of you are always tougher than you. Like my dad's generation, I can't imagine living them. Um, so I don't, I don't know where it goes from here, but, you know, we becoming the old heads. We're becoming those, those guys are like, oh, in my day. You know, we're so much tougher, but I don't know. Uh, I don't know. You're right. It'll be interesting to see what they say in, in 15 years, uh, how their day was. Your day There's was... some hell of athletes now, though, playing baseball. You look at some of these guys. I mean, they're put together like they supposedly got rid of all performance-enhancing drugs. I, I, don't, I look at some of these guys. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I mean, they're monsters. Um, pitchers, too. Some of these pitchers are just jacked. It's like, we, it's like we tell people. If you've got the money, they're always going to find ways to mask it. That's true. That's true. That right. is true. I mean, if I could only do it again, I was too much of a nerd, too scared. Um, I mean, then I <laughs> You're got playing the much. analytics back then with the needle. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> what percentage do I have <laughs> of this round of doing it? So, but, Sounds like me. <laughs> yeah. So, but Bobby, man, I appreciate you jumping on here today and talking yeah. about this, man, catching up with everything. So it was, it was fun trying to just old school stuff and, Seeing what it's yeah. like growing up in the Northeast. I mean, you and I being, you grew up in Philly. I grew up about 20 miles from there. So, you know, of what we had to deal with playing in cold oh, weather. Yeah. Only snow one time, ah. flurries one time. That was it. It was my first year. I was year. cold. I mean, the, the summer, I mean, the winter, what was that, 95 or 6. I mean, we, we didn't go outside one time until we went to Florida um, in college to play ball. I mean, we, <laughs> it was crazy playing in the Northeast. You know, you think about some of those games you played in March. I mean, you're wearing gloves, you're wearing, you know, thermals underneath and it's trying to perform. It's uh, it was, a, it was crazy back then playing, playing bowl in the Northeast still is. I mean, I coached for a little bit and it was the worst coaching. So you're not playing, you're not keeping warm, you're coaching, you're standing there and it's freezing. <laughs> some, of these, some of these places. Oh yeah. I'm, oh, not, yeah. I'm not softer now too. 
No, I I still miss the cold weather. I miss I miss the season changing here. It's we have we have four seasons. We have early summer, midsummer, late summer, and spring. Well, I love Texas. I love the heat in Texas. I love playing in Arlington because it was so hot. It was ridiculous. It was laughable how hot it was playing in there. Uh, like some games, I come in, I you can't even breathe. It was crazy. I always pitched terrible there too because guys are just between Teixeira. I mean, he hit some of the farthest balls ever off me ever in there. I mean, my God, what a great hitters park. Not anymore. The new one for some of the guys say the ball doesn't travel like it does. We've been down there doing stuff. It's, but I, you know, it's still even inside there. It's still, I don't know. It just feels different right now. That it, yeah. You know, you're used to all that. So it's, uh, it's different turf. I'm not a, I mean, I like natural services. You played on the turf mm-hmm. in Toronto. That was that. I played on that That's old school. Bad turf. Oh gosh. Yeah. Yeah. The, the panel. I remember my feet cooking through the turf one day where they had the roof open wearing the cleats and just what? burning through. I played the vet my rookie year. That was like a dream. The old Carpenter was, Cup classic. <laughs> I played uh, that in high yeah, school. The, or then yeah, it was college. We did it in college, but then they did it in high school as well too, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Carpenter Cup in college. I played I played there in, in high school, and then I played my rookie year. I get my first major league home run at the vet. Scott Rowland. There you go. Look at you. Nothing yeah, like doing they, it at home, right? Glory days. <laughs> Shit. Oh, my goodness. Well, Bobby, man, I appreciate you jumping on today. And we'll, uh, yeah, man, best of luck. Yeah, man, we'll, we'll set to catch okay. up down the road, get some more stories down the road for sure. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And, uh, good luck with getting some guys on. If you need any help, let me know. Absolutely, I can... man. I appreciate it. I'll be in touch. I'm, All right. I'm enjoying it. Yes, sir, man. I appreciate right, man. it. Thanks, Bobby. All right. Thanks, guys.